Our next speaker is Ana Pujana. She's an architect uh, from Spain, from Bath Barcelona. She is one of the principals of the Barcelona uh, um, office Mayo, and at this, who is working in the area of housing and other projects. And she is, at the same time, a researcher um, and teacher. She teaches at the Barcelona School of Architecture, ETSAP. And she is also currently one of the editors of Quaderns, you know, the famous Spanish architecture magazine that is always run, you know, periodically by different uh, architectural editors. And um, maybe recently, most importantly, she is involved in a research project that is called the Kitchenless City, for which she has been researching uh, a lot of projects, and she will tell us more about it, but I think it addresses one of the um, center aspects of our um, of our topic today, which is the, the question, how can you create opportunities for people to actually have to interact? Anna, please come to the stage. I don't know why the image is not going, but... Okay, I, I will start. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I will start first. I'm going to try to do it shorter and, uh, and more alive than I expected. I am a researcher and a 19th century researcher, so everything I research is super boring and I used to read. Uh, so to this point that everyone is really tired, I think I have to change my format and I will improvise a little bit. Um, the projector is there, by the way. The oh, good. Is there. Uh, well, um, of course, thank you, um, Andreas, and all the team for inviting me here and all the institutions that have made this event possible. I'm uh, really happy to be here and have the opportunity to share my work with uh, all of you. And I will start today talking about uh, the work, um, a work by Michael Asher. In 1974, the artist uh, was commissioned to do an artwork for a gallery in Los Angeles. Instead of producing um, a new work, so to say, what he did was to remove an existing wall of the gallery that separated the private um, area that hosts the offices from the public area of the gallery. For, so for those visitors that didn't know the work of Michael Asher, it was quite difficult to disguise the work itself. It seemed that nothing had happened, that nothing was on display. The only thing that was visible were the headquarters, the functioning of the gallery itself. So by, mean, by means of a radical architecture gesture, Michael Asher achieved to render visible the political and economical side of the art wall. Changing its conditions and turning private was, until the end, was totally, um, I turned in public what, at the end, and, but until then was totally private. And I'd like to start with this work because basically um, in Mayo we are interested on this kind of works and uh, those architectural actions that are at the same time a statement and that allow things to happen and having implications that go beyond architecture itself. Um, so the first um, thing that I'm gonna do is kind of introduce myself um, through where we work. Um, so five years ago, together with my partners, um, we decided to open a studio for professionals from different fields. And at that time, you have to place yourself, we were in uh, 2011 in Spain. We were in a really, really deep crisis, not only economical and professional, it was also, what is more important, it was mainly social. So somehow we had the need to um, produce new ways of, um, to design new ways of producing architecture in order to face the instability of the moment, and it was not only because of the economy. So with that goal in mind, we just took um, this place in Barcelona and we basically took off um, the roof and the floor of a room, opening a patio and dividing the space into areas. The front area is always le empty and um, left empty and we host, we host events and exhibitions. Um, the whole hall whole is placed there. Um, meanwhile, the rear area is the most important place. It's a 12 and a half meters long uh, table where all professions gather and work together. Um, so 
For us, the table works as the wall in my Clasher um, piece. Um, in uh, Mayo, working teams are kind of flexible, so we have an horizontal um, a structure um, that varies depending on the needs. We have a Mutable infrastructure where everyone has its own role and works under uh, this hierarchy. And somehow, everything that it's thought in the front has an impact in the rear, of course, and everything that it's produced in the rear has an impact um, in the front. What for me is more important is that when we start all this story, uh, I'm pretty sure that all of us consider it was kind of um, in between situation, just a turning point because of the economy. But uh, through these last years, it became not only a way of working, but also a way of understanding architecture itself. So the way we work, the place we work, defines how we work, as you will see. So for us, architecture organizes and builds relationships defining possible futures. It that has a beginning or an end is always kind of a continuous process of something precedent. And, uh, and it's always, um, but it's really important in our work, it's always in a permanent state of unfinishedness. That is one of the reasons why in Mayo um, we believe and work in special systems and formats, that's what we do. Um, we design instructions of you, rules, and et cetera. A type of order that allows appropriation and change through time. And we work with this philosophy in all kind of projects. And I'm just gonna point out two that will introduce you, the kitchen is life. For instance, soon after opening the studio, we won a competition held by the Kiss City Council of Barcelona. With the crisis, the city was filled with empty lots that needed to be built. And, um, and somehow, and that, the lots were waiting to be built, and somehow they, it, there was the need to avoid their decay. So the competition demanded to design an ephemeral urban space that had to last at least 15 years. The concept of ephemeral here is kind of a really large. The budget was, of course, super tight, and uh, of course, it was not enough to fulfill our neighbors' needs and wishes. And what was also really uh, meaningful is that most of the wishes were not, like they were contradictory. So it was impossible to satisfy everyone. So basically, we decided to do almost nothing. We decided to design a light infrastructure that could grow and allow mutability through time and encourage citizen appropriation and social engagement. So the proposal is uh, based on um, a definition of um, a regular grid of poles that organizes the urban space and hosts lighting and electrical system. Um, and the grid is just um, completed by a tension cable that work as a temporary support for whatever. Um, and of course, the, we took um, into consideration all needs and the grid is uh, designed in order to um, fit the maximum possible neighbor's requirements. Uh, so somehow, um, the project proposes a urban space understood and an unfinished space. So we didn't build a, a design um, a, a a urban space, basically we design the potentials conditions that would allow its open definition in its future by means of consensus and what is more important in our case, dissent. Uh, so the fact um, when the grid was built, um, it has two years already and, and I just bring one picture. Um, I realize I didn't want to talk too much about this project, but I think that today can be controversial. So after these two years, the, the grid has been uh, completed in many um, ways after a lot of neighbors, meetings, and discussions. And we, we keep on, we, we look forward how it keeps on evolving and, uh, and growing. For us, was, um, it was our first project, and um, it was really hard uh, when uh, we finished it. Basically, we were on the news as the worst uh, square ever in Barcelona. And of course, we are a city that we're really proud of our public space. And basically, the fact is that this image is kind of uh, sweet and nice. Um, I, I had to, had to brought uh, a better image. But you have to imagine that at the beginning, there was nothing else rather than the poles. So the reaction of the neighbors was really aggressive. First, we are not used to understand a public space as something unfinished. 
and we have to change the mentality because we have to understand that it's a place that has to allow consensus, but also dissent and discussion, and also has to be a place where everything can happen with all problems and controversies with it. Um, so, so basically, we work in the same way with um, all projects and in other um, scales. I'm going to go through really fast with um, in, um, in this. Um, so we, pro we were sitting in a similar way when we were commissioned to design um, an exhibition um, uh, called Species of Spaces, of course, based on Perec's book in uh, MAGBA, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Barcelona. And there, what we did was to create um, a series Sorry. So what we did was to create a series of generic spaces that could fit the content. Uh, we wanted that the specificity of each space uh, was defined by its content, but not the continent. That's why it's not that far away from the square. Um, like it happens with this um, comic by Nicholas Rook, where all the characters have been removed, and suddenly one can think that infinite stories can happen within the same background. So. We design a set of rooms, a grid of square rooms of identical dimensions. And at the end, the character of each space was defined by the objects and the artwork that was displayed rather than by its enclosures. And I'm, I wanted to bring this project because it's basically the idea um, of generic rooms that allow several ways of being occupied is something that we have um, used in a housing block in Barcelona that we are just finishing. Um, finishing its construction, of course. Um, we were asked um, for that to design a housing block that its interior arrangement could be mutable in order to answer to the changes of the need. So it, could, it had to, to be able to change. Um, with that um, aim, the arrangement of the apartment is designed as a system of rooms that can be used as desired, and where the program is not determined. Each apartment can be expanded or reduced, adding or subtracting rooms in order to answer to inhabitant needs. Um, the fact that the rooms are equal in size, and that's super important for us, eliminates all kind of hierarchy, and therefore all, the, all of them can be used for any purpose. Um, and of course, this flexibility is also able due to the position of the bathrooms and so on, but I'm not going to go into that. And of course, there's a lot of references. We are placed in the middle of a champla. A champla, we like swallow culture of that. It's the generic grid with everything can happen. And of course, we are not inventing anything. And the end is that reenactment of the traditional typology that was already there, that most of the rooms were equal, and our floor plan is not that different. So everything was already there. So the, just, I'm not going to go through this, but basically everything is a reenactment of the typology itself. Even the facade, it's exactly done as it was done um, decades ago. One of, recently somebody asked me if it was a refurbishment, so I considered that a really big compliment. Um, and I'm here today basically to talk about um, domestics and sharing, of course, and commons and luxury. Um, so at the end, what we're doing here is we, we propose to understand the house as a domestic system with no special hierarchy and without a predetermined program. A house like that allows appropriation and change through time, as I was saying, and this kind of flexible apartment actually were usual at the verge of the 20th century in New York, where the house was understood as an open system, mutable and adaptable on demand. For instance, the image that you see um, now, um, the apartments of the San Remo had adjoining rooms that could be open, expanding the initial space with an extra room, connecting two, three, or even four apartments. Of course, this historical typology has been clearly a reference to address um, our housing block. And what is really interesting about them is that this flexibility was not only reduced to space on demand, but also to services on demand. So sometimes the kitchen was eliminated from the floor plan and left apart. And the apartment, therefore, was kitchenless. As you can see, there's no kitchen at all. And here starts my story. 
So the story um, of this flexible um, typology dates back from the, um, and I'm going really back, uh, to the economic depression that followed the American Civil War, 1860, 1865, so I'm really talking about 19th century, all types. Um, when due to the lack of land and housing stock, most of American cities, um, as in United States cities, needed to build apartments at lower cost for middle class tenements. At that moment, new architectural solutions for this middle class appeared that not only reduced significantly the cost of living, but also allows the elimination of housekeeping annoyances through, of course, the elimination of the kitchen. Appeared then, diff then different typologies that uh, remember the hotel living compared the typology of the European apartment with the typology of the hotel apartment. And at the end, this fact of erasing the kitchen rendered visible a lot of things that are along with it, as you will see, and we will talk about politics and economic and so on, as it happened with Michael Asher's work. So it was in 1871 when the first... Um, apartment without kitchen appear in New York, and it appeared just one year after a regular, the first apartment uh, building with kitchens was built. So they both, both typology at, appear at the same time. It was not something extraordinary, it was actually something um, common. And, um, and after the, this first case, the, the typology was super successful. For many reasons. First, not only because it reduced uh, significantly the cost of living, and, um, and um, of course, eliminated the annoyances of housekeeping, but also because, consequently, it redefined the role of women at home, and that was super important. So, at some, in, certain, in a certain manner, life in these new apartments constitute at some point an alternative that it was not only related because of economy, because of lack of uh, um, economy, but also it was related to comfort. And the proof of, of this is that um, you, we can find from little apartments as this one for, uh, for cheap rents, um, that is basically a room and a parlor and a bathroom, to this one, the Astor, Astor Apartment House um, from 1901, that basically there are two apartments for pl per floor plan, and if you take a look, there's a slow library, dining room, many other rooms, but no kitchen at all. So, um, so I've spent many years collecting them, um, collecting floor plans and mapping them, and um, basically through that I realize, um, and of course I'm talking about just um, the New York case, I realized that the, 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 the peak of the typology uh, happened between 1901 and 1929, and I quote this because um, basically what happened is that um, part of the success, it was not only because they were welcoming, so they, it was, um, something that people desire, but basically also because of a law. In 1901 appeared the Tenement House Law, which regulate the conditions of residential buildings, and without purpose, they left apart this kitchenless typology. So the kitchenless typology was not under the scope of the law, so suddenly, in the same lot, this typology could build much more square meters than another typology. So this loser legal framework made apartment hotels clearly advantages for developers as well. Um, so suddenly they were good investments. And at the same time, rent could therefore decrease and reduce making collective domestic services affordable to a wide range of the population. So they were cheap. Um, and I wanted to tell this because law matters, and law matters a lot. And what happened also is that um, with along the conveniences of uh, comfort um, and flexibility, um, these um, buildings end up being true social condensers, for instance. And, and, and they blur somehow the limits in between um, the public and the private, what was the street, what was the, so the domestic sphere and the urban sphere, for instance. Uh, the Belcler, 
1903, offered a lot of um, several public lunches and dining rooms and a, of, and a rooftop open to the public where one could enjoy marvelous, um, spectacular views. And, um, and also having this public character, these new residential houses had a strongly speculative and commercial aim. They were considered profitable, as I was mentioning, um, and therefore, one of the reasons why it was high, it was um, one of the reasons of their flexibility is basically because it was highly appreciated that such buildings could offer uh, flexible size apartments not only to offer a good service for its inhabitants but also to, to satisfy a bigger demand and a bigger wider social range. Uh, for instance, the Ansonia and. Um, this one allowed uh, some flats, as you can see, there are many, many typologies. And some of the, the flats, as the San Remo, as the one that we have seen, could be expanded thanks to this uh, little room that had two doors connecting to the apartment or to the corridor. But also, if you take to, uh, a look to the floor plan, you can find from a super large apartments with kitchens to really tiny apartments without kitchen. And of course, in, during this period, the, luxurious, the luxury of the services were am amazing. Not only spaces and uh, uh, kitchen and laundry and etc., but also the Ansonia, for instance, had even a farm on, on the roof, and we're talking about 1903s, and that ca could offer fresh milk and fresh air, um, eggs to its inhabitants. So they were already producing their own food. Um, let me explain you a little bit this because it's really this part is quite interesting. Um, so, um, as this typology became widespread and well known, uh, long before it appeared, the well known Frankfurt Kitchen, and I want to quote it here a reduce of set of appearances uh, of uh, cooking um, appliances began to be installed in the apartments, in these kitchenless apartments. So this kind of um, homemade kitchenette devices uh, appeared before the first uh, proper kitchenette was designed. And uh, what happened is basically that tenant used to style uh, gadgets for occasional cooking in the rooms. And of course, um, this um, um, suddenly was a boom of uh, commercial um, uh, kitchen gadget, kitchen and gadgets that at the end pro progressively this uh, kitchen became a product by itself. So it ended up being included in furniture catalogs, allowing to convert any um, cupboard into a kitchen. Um, gonna go us with it. So basically what is interesting about this time is that um, while the kitchenette was originally a promise of maximum fun functionality within the, within the minimum space, um, like the Murphy bed or the folding bed, it nevertheless, nevertheless became an, out an increasingly autonomous architectural device up until the Frankfurt kitchen. Uh, what happened is basically that during the First World War, the concept of efficiency was applied to everything, even to domestics. Uh, since men were mobilized to um, the military, women had to fill the job vacancies, and suddenly uh, it highlighted the lack of domestic help and, of course, the incompatibility between housekeeping and business hours. Many articles at a time um, were published about um, Christine Frederick's uh, scientific methods, um, and of course, women, um, they gave, she gave women the opportunity to earn a domestic engineer uh, degree, elevating the category of housework into uh, science. And, uh, and of course, it was supposedly thanks to these new methodologies, women were able to execute a higher number of household scores with less effort. Housekeeping was not longer considered something tedious, but rather a tool to th through which women would aim achieve social recognition. Um, so somehow self um, domestic was value. And of course, by the time of the New Deal, the, um, 
with the domestic, sorry, with the domestic engineer at, at its pinnacle, a house without a kitchen and collective kitchens were suddenly unconceivable, and we can talk about that. There's many reasons. And, uh, and of course, when the economic crash, economic crash happened in 1929, few apartment hotels and kitchenless houses survived, and the heyday of this typology was over in the United States. What happened um, is that at the beginning of the 20th century, um, this American typology uh, was largely published worldwide, influencing the construction of similar housing uh, with collective housekeeping facilities, some of them still running today. So after I end up the New York uh, research, I start collecting these international cases that are still um, um, working today from all kinds of periods, from historical ones to uh, actual ones. And, um, and, and then I realized that some of them were really directly influenced by the, um, the American kitchen, some of them not. So and we basically know that just the tip of the icebergs, there's a lot of it. Um, and of course, meanwhile, the collective kitchen and kitchen living has been popularly known by its communist character, and this has um, gone through the day a lot, due to the influence that they had in the Russia uh, after the revolution, and of course, uh, the, the super popularly known Komunalki. Uh, this collection of uh, cases, um, and including the New York ones, proved that quite the opposite, and that's quite controversial. The typology is uh, apolitical, so it's political in the sense that it can be um, repoliticized over and over. So um, it's, the form cannot be political per se, as Aldo Rossi claims, but it can be just repoliticized in uh, over the course of the of the time in a never-ending re recurring cycle. So studying them, there's three basically three. Uh, Mm, reasons why this typology um, is uh, running nowadays. One, um, those that have been promoted by the private sector as the American cases that I've explained today and I'm gonna uh, show you some. Those that are uh, promoted by the um, public sector, by the government, some of them used as political tools. And third, some of them that are self-promoted as the cooperative that we have just um, seen before. In terms of uh, private promotion in sharing and common spaces, for instance, in China, collective domestic um, collective spaces and, and, and services are being promoted nowadays by Lei Jun, the founder of the mobile phone com company Xiaomi, that it's basically uh, Steve Jobs of uh, China. Um, and he um, is building affordable housing with shared spaces for young generation, which, which salary can barely support um, their basic living costs. And what is extraordinary is that they are already six, 18 buildings like that in the, in built in the recent years and hosting around 5,000 people. Um, Japan is a really, really interesting situation because it's a mix between private and public sector. Um, what happened is that basically in, two, in 2012, uh, for the first time, the percentage of people living alone in Tokyo topped the 50%, and we uh, talked about it before. So society is changing really fast as we are, as um, there are housing typologies. So um, basically the government decided to do something. And we can find, of course, really well-known projects as this one, a big scale projects, or much more small projects from, uh, that are coming as well from the private sector. So we can find private and public sector promoting these typologies. Um, something similar is um, happening in Korea, in South Korea. And um, on the other hand, uh, nowadays in India, collective kitchens are actually popping up thanks to solar cooking. So it's totally different from the rest of um, my presentation. A cooking technology that is accessible and easy to build up from scratch by anyone and efficient when it's collective. That's what it's really important. So at Tilania, the Barefoot College teaches rural women how to manufacture and cook on solar cookers in order to help them to have an income as well as decrease their home consumes. They have built a solar collective kitchen that serves meals to the whole community. And for me, these cases are um, 
interesting because um, the domestic system appears when the kitchen is eliminated from the home and turned collective. So there's not a necessity to, bring, to build anything from new, it's just built a collective kitchen in a certain position to affect a whole neighborhood. And it's actually something that is happening in Canada and Australia where multiple associations promote community kitchens to reduce consumed waste and labor, of course. Um, and what is also really important in that case to assure healthy food consumption. They're growing. In Canada, there are more of 1,500 registered and there are a lot more without a registration. And of course, I'm gonna end up with this case that it's a sac from East, probably the most iconic and paradigmatic building that we have in Vienna. Um, but it's already a cultural, um, it's a self-promoted case and it ended up being um, quite a big, big cultural institution, but also at the end uh, brings a lot of um, controversial issues. For instance, in the sac from East, in your rent, there's also included a social security part, so if you lose your work or if you're in a social exclusion, the community helps you. So to, to which point these new housing institutions are substituting what the, the kind of, um, um, what the city council should be doing. So where's the limit between the community, the self-promoted community and uh, the government um, duties? Uh, we can discuss about that. And I'm always, um, so at the end for me, what is really important about this case is that the house is understood not as a single entity, but as a system of parts that go beyond its physicality. So it's not about the space on demand, just about that, it's about, what you can get from it. And um, always to provoke a little bit, I use this data that is from the National Institute of um, Statistics from the United States. Of course, we're talking about the states that it's, everything is kind of exaggerated. But, um, but I like to, to name it, and, and I'm not fond of data, but this helps. In 1973, the first mobile phone appeared and it just offered 30 minutes of talk time. And at that time, uh, we used to spend 32 hours per week in housekeeping duties. Nowadays, our mobile phones, we have eight hours on talk time and 4G and et cetera, but we still spend the same amount of hours as in the 70s and in labor at home. And that makes you think that at the end, that's a housing and design problem, and it's not about uh, technology, it's also sometimes about the typology, and it's not about inventions, it's just about intentions. Thank you. Okay, are there questions? Um, I have one, just to, to understand a little bit better um, what's the connection between the disappearance of the kitchenless apartment typology and the New Deal? Is that directly connected? Um, yes. It's not my, my topic, but uh, yeah. Uh, basically because I don't like the New Deal. Uh, well, basically everything during the First World War, um, the discussion uh, if you read Ladies Come Journal and uh, most popular magazines, the main discussion was uh, where to go, or to be kitchenless, or to be um, the kitchen. And the um, United States start to study laws in order to increase um, the national income, and one of, uh, and I think that that's well known, one of the solutions was to increase consumption and uh, it's easy, it's easier to, if you have an individual house, you will end up buying one um, laundry machine. If you live in collectivity, you will share one. So um, that's why they start um, to promote uh, single family houses and that's the new deal. And uh, in a certain moment, they were even free and uh, they changed the housing law in New York in 1929 um, due to the hotel um, lobby pressure that didn't like this kitchenless living because the kitchenless also apartments, buildings also offer rooms for rent uh, per night. So it was a 
quite blurry situation. And of course, the hotel lobby, that it, at that time, I was already really, really powerful, didn't like it at all. So it, it's like a plane crash. There were many, many reasons. And the New Deal is connected, yes. Um, I have a question. So thank you very much for your talk, Anna. Um, I found this super fascinating to just kind of challenge your conception of, OK, an apartment needs a kitchen. It's one of the rooms. It's a bathroom, bedroom, dining room, kitchen. Um, I guess, out of curiosity, do you live in an apartment with a kitchen? Um, I have a small cooking device, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious to ask myself, are we taking certain things for granted? Earlier today we talked about how we have all this space that we actually don't use at the same time. Is there anything else we should be challenging? Anything we take as given part of an apartment that maybe could be um, rethought? The bathroom. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I mean, um, here it's not usual to share, but we have other culture and cultures that they share the bathroom and it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, but uh, if the kitchen provokes, I mean, I just Google at Earth Daily when um, I um, publish, I mean, they published an interview of somebody else, well, whatever. The reaction was such, like incredible aggressive, like insulting me, like, um, Oh, my wife uh, loves to cook, but also co go back to the communist uh, area or move to Russia. Like, incredible with nonsense uh, critics. And you realize that, um, that uh, basically the kitchen has been a political tool um, during the 20th century, not only in the States, but in Europe. And that's why we have today so many cooking TV shows, and um, we love cooking, I love cooking, and health is through cooking, and uh, how we cook, and what we eat, and so on. So uh, it's one of the most provocative things. Maybe the next step is gonna be the bathroom. <laughs> where, uh, where did people actually eat uh, that lived in those um, uh, kitchenless apartment buildings in New York that you showed, these early ones? Um, well, it's, it's never been one typology, basically. So there were uh, buildings that the apartment had a little kitchen. Mm -hmm. Like, it was not a, known as a kitchen, it was known as a kitchenette. And um, those that uh, lack of kitchen, they had a common dining room. And all of them had common dining rooms and collective kitchens, some, something similar of, um, as the one, the case that we have seen before um, by the Plex architect. So it, it worked in a similar way. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, not political with a small P, but political with a large P ramification of the kitchen, because I was recently involved in a project in the UK where we tried to uh, uh, eliminate the kitchen. Uh, I mean, I'm, I was aware of your work before, This was, and this really set off, let's say, a desire to explore this. And what we discovered is that actually uh, the kitchen is the room by which the house is legally defined. So when they do the census, to come and take the population measure. It's how many, uh, a house is defined by how many people share a kitchen. So if you remove the kitchen, it actually becomes a huge uh, like legal problem. Uh, I wondered if this was something you had encountered before or? Uh, yeah, um, basically I didn't show this image. Um, but one of the reasons why the kitchen was, could be a, um, left apart, it was basically, um, because in at the 19th century it was not well seen. Now it's something totally different, and um, just the, basically we, we um, the working class um, was living in this type of um, apartments that were based on one just one room um, uh, with more than one family. Basically, no kitchen, no um, bathroom, and the first housing law was addressed to them, just to them, and they were controlling who was cooking in the place to control how many families were living there. Um, so that's why, um, that's why it was accepted to not to have the kitchen. Basically, it was a social also distinction from that uh, social class. And uh, also what happened is that they um, drawing the law, so um, um, defining the law, they didn't, um, thought about the other typology. 
Um, and at the end, it was much more profitable. So somehow, it's better to be out of the law. It's kind of the sac fabric, for instance. It's not a housing uh, building. It's an hostel. Mm -hmm. So that's why, for instance, um, they have been able to build um, common spaces instead of parking lot. So they didn't need to build one parking lot per housing, but they need to build one parking lot per 10 houses. So that amount of space, it was, and again, we, we can still work in between laws as they were uh, working in order to do collective uh, things um, affordable. I mean, I'm really intrigued by your, by your presentation, by this whole thought, but I would like to ask you actually, would you go as far as to say that the, um, the, 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 um, the invention um, of the individualized uh, kitchen, the kitchen per apartment, is, you know, if you see it in Michel Foucault's kind of, through his eyes, was, was an attempt to discipline and individualize uh, masses in the sense, or let's to, to, to demassify them, to basically singularize them, to keep people in the apartment as opposed to have them, you know, uh, experience themselves collectively. I mean, if you, if you, I just thought of basically whenever I think of being in Asia, for instance, um, there the act of eating is actually very often an urban act uh, because the street food is so cheap and it's uh, so good at the same time. Often you can't do it the same, you can't do it as quickly, you can't do it as good, and not as cheap. And so this, this idea that you eat at home is, is maybe not something universal, right? And it's, it's, it's something rather specific. But would you, could you really say that it's, yeah, a, it's an ideological proposition? I, I, I totally agree, it's an ideological, it's 100% an ideological uh, thing. And, and us, um, for architects, it's even stronger because we, I, I, I live in, at my school, we were taught that, uh, and, um, um, the Frankfurt kitchen was the first compact kitchen and efficient and so on. And basically, the Frankfurt kitchen, it was, uh, it followed the reference from this, uh, um, um, American cases, uh, but there's a, something that it's, important and in its lacking that the collective kitchen was erased in the process of uh, reenactment. So somehow we lost a lot. We end up with the uh, minimum kitchen without the big kitchen, think, considering that that was um, super efficient and the best for us. Okay. There is a question actually in the back, Martina. <clears throat> Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, the kitchen in the east, you have this communal kitchen. Is there a reference between the kitchen of the 19th century? So I think also, because when I saw this the first time, what could be also the, the issue of uh, constructing this situation? Well, it was, it, the references are, are clear. I cannot, like, it's something that I'm still researching. And, um, but the, um, the reference are direct. And basically, um, uh, also the red scar when, the, when it started in the, in the United States, um, it was a reaction to that, to this uh, transfer of culture between uh, United States and, and Russia. And uh, these collective systems started to be seen as something communist that until then they were not at all. So it was pure commercial. Of course, we can uh, quote some of them that were experimental and ideological, but I'm, I'm more focused on the commercial ones just because I want to also uh, uh, show that, uh, that it can happen in many regimes, in, with many ideologies, and in many ways. So it's not that collectivity is uh, just uh, communist or capitalist. It can be truly capitalist, depending how it is defined. I just uh, I have a, a last question here. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure it's a question actually, but uh, a reaction maybe. Um, basically, if you remove the kitchen from a modern apartment, it looks like an office space. I mean, uh, in an office space, um, is really like uh, has every, uh, everything that an apartment will, will have except for the kitchen. Um, so and and in fact that 
form of living and working in the same space, the ambiguity of space, you know, what we call the tool house, um, which we see being a recurrent typology, um, you know, whether it's in, in post-war Japan uh, or in, in, uh, in Mumbai today, um, you know, all over places which have not been planned, um, is quite an amazing, you know, uh, form of, uh, of, um, of optimizing space. Um, and of course, also it's connected to communal living in one way or the other. Uh, this is actually, it's 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 very common to have a common kitchen uh, in uh, in in many neighborhood in Mumbai. I mean, you see like uh, cooking being done together in the street, um, in some neighborhoods. Uh, so, uh, I guess the question, and, and I just wanted to say, in the case of Switzerland, and a policy recommendation. <laughs> um, something which is quite amazing is that each time there's a new plan, uh, an urban plan for a neighborhood you always have to say what percentage of it will be um, housing and what percentage of it will be dedicated to activity. And it is, it's completely um, an aberration because uh, we know that in today's world, according to I mean, there's one of the statistics I've seen recently, I don't know how reliable it is, it wasn't wired, is that uh, this year 40% of Americans um, will work from home at least part of the week. Um, so it's really like a global condition. It's always been there, and it's now coming back in a big way. Um, you know, there's really a need there to shift our perception uh, in terms of what is a home, what is an office. Uh, and I'm just wondering if in the case of New York uh, in 19th century, late 19th century, if um, some of those, um, you know, kitchenless uh, apartment blocks were also used for, you know, any kind of economic activity or productive activity. Um, not inside the home. Um, they realize in like the first, you, at the beginning, at the early beginning, the restaurant was always private. So everything that was common, it was enclosed from the public uh, sphere. But uh, just after the first year, the first in infrastructure opened the restaurant to the public and they realized that they were doing much more money. So suddenly they become public. So that you could walk, and, and it, again, it was super commercial. Um, and in, in regarding um, that, the work uh, space and the mix uh, between living and working is actually what uh, Lei Jung is doing in China. He basically did um, a demographic study uh, looking at um, um, the tendency of young people, and he realized, or at least, at least it's what he says, I don't know what he, how he has done this study, but he basically always claimed that compared to the states, uh, in China, the 98% of people between 25 and 45 doesn't want to own anything, they want to share everything, to share the space of living and to share the space of working compared to the 45% that it's uh, in the same social range in the States. So um, realizing that he has started like really with a, promotion, um, a commercial aim, building these buildings where uh, spaces of work are mixed with uh, housing. And basically what he also claims, what is kind of uh, scary, is that um, if you work together, you're going to also increase your um, social status because you're gonna uh, and change a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, meet a lot of people and therefore your salary and your uh, um, working state is gonna be better through time. So again, it's double coin. Uh... A final question? Uh, yeah, no, well, I, I wanted to pick up on that and also on the other comment as well about, uh, I mean, I think the, of course, it's important to remember that the distinction between life and work is an extremely recent one. I mean, I'm sure many people in this room will have a family name which reflects a profession, which is not like, it's not your name, it's a description of what you are. And, uh, you know, so this, this idea of separation of the spaces is, is very recent. I wouldn't at all be surprised. I don't think it's a you know, product of a particularly, uh, you know, disastrous era that we return to that. Um, but the, the question about, let's say, communal living and, and live work in that sense, I mean, I think the, the worry that I always get when I hear these ideas is that there is, and especially when we talk about rent and sharing in the context of common luxury, is that it's, it's perfectly acceptable to desire uh, the flexibility of rent over the obligation and often the debt of ownership. However, 
This often comes at the cost of exiting out of uh, a, a market of capital appreciation. So this is, the, for me, the huge difference between the Swiss model, for example, of, of communal uh, housing versus, uh, let's say, an, a, a British model we're seeing rising at the moment, which is uh, just pure rental. Uh, which is that, you know, maybe you don't own your own apartment, maybe you rent it, but if you own a percentage of the company that manages the building, and that, that percentage is tied to the value of the building itself, you don't lose out as the building, you know, because otherwise you have people who rent their whole life and never have any savings and have no possibility of ever improving their social standing because all of the profit from that is being isolated in a particular group, thereby accelerating social inequality. So I'm very... It's, it's super difficult to know how we can, in a way, preserve the positive values of neoliberalism, which are mobility and freedom, while not losing, uh, you know, let's say, the accelerating economic inequality. That's a pretty interesting point. Maybe you can ex extrapolate that after your talk. I would like to thank Anna Pujana first now. <laughs> <laughs>